uh, I would like to introduce Kore Vogelset from the Nord uh, University in Bude in uh, Norway. He's a professor for studies of professional practice at the Center for Practical Knowledge in Bude. And um, his research fields are teaching and learning, pedagogy and education, teacher training, uh, e-learning, blended learning and pedagogy or pedagogical theory and didactics, perhaps to, uh, to add. Um, he's one of the uh, old scholars and members of our symposium. Yeah, he joined the first one uh, we, we made in Freiburg in the 10 years or 15 years ago. So he has a long tradition and long relation to uh, Bude. Uh, in the perspective of phenomenology, of course. Um, and um, Kare represents um, um, an approach um, with Alfred Schütz and Berger Luckmann. Um, and he is a, a specialist in this um, perspective. He, is, uh, he translated the works of uh, Alfred Schütz in Norwegian. Uh, it you know, it's came out um, everyday life in science last year or this year, and um, he is the author of the book Phenomenology and Empiry, um, which came out last year, and this year he organized with some colleagues in uh, Bude the Nangeroni conference, a big conference. Um, in the, uh, with the topic Virtus et Humanitas, Virtues and Humanity, in the European, old European um, perspective. So, I'm uh, very glad that uh, you are here, Kare. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, please. Thank you, Malta. And also for the um, for the, um, the uh, presentation and also for for the opportunity to present my my paper here. Um, I call it multiple realities in the classroom, and this is part of a larger project of mine um, dealing about how to elaborate different non affirmative building strategies, I'll explain it afterwards, in multicultural classrooms. <clears throat> Where we can ask, what can a teacher following a non-affirmative strategy do now in meeting with all these different realities as represented by students in school? The problem, of course, has aggravated a so-called post-truth area. It puts extra weight on known already known multicultural challenges. So this is, uh, in short, what I'm going to, to try to deal with. My own background, as Malta said, I'm a teacher educator. I also teach um, didactics related to the subject religion, philosophy, and ethics. So I've outlined a plan for my presentation. I'm going to, to look a little bit first on how to answer this call for papers. Secondly, what is actually the problem of a multicultural classroom? Thirdly, I'm going to explain a little bit about my theoretical approach. And um, fourth, a little bit also about the, the um, going to the this theory of multiple realities of Alfred Schutz. Fifth, I want to see how we can transfer this theory to school situations. And sixth, I want to say something about this finite provinces of meaning and subgroups that uh, the, the, uh, the relationships between these concepts. I've looked at in-group biases and I have a short look on non-affirmative solutions and also perhaps, and also in the end, uh, a solution perhaps in what is called possibilism. It's a notion by um, American uh, philosopher Nicholas uh, Rescher. Okay. Um, I, I'm, what I'm presenting is more or less what I, what I actually um, 
speak about. I follow closely the text, so it will be easier for you to, 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 to follow, I think. Uh, in the call, wanted papers examining the constitution and the modes of experience of realities in a phenomenological and pedagogical perspective. And one option was that to do this from the perspective of building educational learning in pedagogical institutions and to investigate them in didactic context. This is exactly what I want to, want to do. And my approach then is on the basis of a phenomenological approach to social life initiated by Alfred Schütz. So, the problem we face is evident and actually present. We see them in state schools, particularly in multicultural societies, and particularly where the religious expressions are tolerated, for instance, the hijab, when religions and secular worldviews are thematized, where ethical and political questions are debated concerning such as gender, racism, and democracy, where historical issues, national stories of the past are presented and discussed, where philosophical conversations of inquiry are undertaken, etc. All these kind of, of themes in the same classroom. It is the present problem. So my point at departure is, in fact, a very practical one. Uh, there is an actual problem here that needs theoretical clarification for teachers in this situation. And my approach is systematic, I would say, in the relation to the call, and it's an approach that also prepares for empirical classroom studies in this era. Let me first say a little bit about my theoretical approach, the phenomenology of social life and relationships between phenomenology and empirical studies. I start from Alfred Schutz. He was the Austrian-American philosopher of cultural science, one have to say, but also, as Malte Nan mentioned, also want to, to draw on Thomas Luckmann and Peter Berger and their um, book on social construction of reality. And it, it, this approach is often called the social, a social phenomenology, which is not perhaps uh, quite correct. One should perhaps, with Luckmann, say that it's a, a phenomenologically oriented study of social cultural phenomena, because phenomenology in itself is not social, but this is um, social life phen um, phenomenologically analyzed. And Schultz was also a social hermeneutical theorist. This had been explicated by these German scholars, Staudigl and Etzroth, for instance. And particular interest for me are Schultz's theories on the everyday life world and other realities in our lives. Uh, uh, there are several social theorists working with the Husserlian Lebensfeld life world perspective that use this as a basis for interpretive sociological approach, for instance, the Verstehende Sociologie, as Berger and Luckmann and his and their students. But you see it also in critical theory in sociology, ethnomethodology, videography, etc. It's a vast use of it today. However, however this um, social approach is not limited to sociology, of course. The insights coming out of the approach are relevant for all social and human or cultural studies, sciences in general, and to use the, the German word for it, the Geisteswissenschaften, including pedagogy, of course, educational theory and empirical studies on school. So applied phenomenology may also be used for this approach. Uh, at least when the theories coming from the phenomenological reduction concerning the structures of the life world are transferred or recontextualized, so to say, where the brackets are removed. Phenomenology and empirical studies are two different spheres. Luckmann says they are ecological, ecological and cosmological. That should not be mixed. This is the, the position of, of Luckmann. It's an indirect relationship, he says, between phenomenology and empirical studies of any kind. So perhaps the label 
phenomenologically oriented empirical studies is a less, less confusing um, label. It could be illustrated in this way. They have empirical studies and phenomenological studies in, in a parallel movement, so to say, in two parallel movements, but there's always a contact, there's a parallel movement, it's interactive relationship with the dialogue between the different movements at the same time. The main phenomenological, phenomenological um, life world theory of Schutz was that there, is, there are not only one social reality, but several realities, uh, multiple realities. There is the everyday life world, which is the main one, and the question now if this theory of his may help us to understand our multicultural and post-truth situations in schools. So, you have to look. Uh, to dig deeper into this theory of multiple realities. It was written by Alfred Schutz, uh, published in 1945. He had been um, working on it in the 1930s, uh, but he wasn't able to, to, to publish it earlier because he, he had to flee um, uh, Austria, Vienna in 1938. He had, had this um, Jewish background, had to flee after the Anschluss. And he went, first went to France and then um, again to New York, where he, in 1952, I think, he was um, hired at the New School for Social Research, together with Hannah Arendt, for instance. So, but, uh, during the, um, the war, he, he uh, worked further on this theory and published it in 1945. So. What does he mean by saying that it's just, just one reality, but several? Um, a reality is here what he calls a finite province of meaning. And finite here means confined, in a way. Each of these realities have different kinds of things taken for granted. We interpret phenomena in these provinces while we are there. In the limited social, cultural, interpretive universes or interpretation, provinces, areas. And we normally, all of us, move between them, um, several of them, every day. The main one is always the everyday life world, the Lebensweltliche Alltagswelt. This world is practical and it's intersubjective. And Schutz analyzes, he gives some examples and analyzes these realities. He mentions dreams, he mentions science, scientific uh, work, he mentions theater, um, we could add perhaps cinemas, but he also mentions religious experience, religious um, um, situations um, in the church or the mosque or a temple or any kind. He mentions the world of art, he mentions children's play, and also madness. And he has a, has a very readable article on, on Don Quixote, Don Quixote uh, experience. But he, of course he has left this theory for us to further elaboration. Uh, the, the, uh, the realities have a logic of, an, of their own, we could say, that we must understand in order to act in them and be able to study them or orient ourselves after events. Um, the title of the article has its origin in an early work by the American psychologist William James, that all these phenomenologists were very fond of, of course. Um, uh, an article on the experience of living in social sub-universes or sub-groups, and he uses this um, Schultz uses it. James said that in sub-universes there are mental attitudes we can compare and contrast. For instance, practical work, science, dream, fantasy, or imagining something in the mind, in the imagination. And Schultz phenomenologizes it, so to say, liberates it, the, this idea from its psychological setting. He shows how we are in these relatives in different ways and attitudes. When you are in one reality, you have a particular attitude. 
you believe in one set of objects and abolish belief in objects in the others. The different worlds, each having their own type of parenthesis and epoche, he's using this phenomenological word, not in the Husserlian sense, but um, it's a word that refers to abolishing the belief of something. So when you believe in something, it's the reality for you. When you believe in the world of your daily practical work, you trust to objects in the other worlds is temporality abstracted. In typical for the everyday life experience is the epoche of doubt, for instance. The floor is solid enough to carry me. When you believe in imagined and fictional objects, when you see a play, uh, a movie, your world of work is for a time abolished. And this holds good also for daydreaming and in fact also theoretical work. What we directly and indirectly believe in the daily practical work life, working life and also in theorizing is particularly well organized, he says. While the world of play and other performance, especially, especially dreams, are not all well organized. With regard to sociality in the different realities, two people can act together while they work. And they can do so when they imagine things in the imagination, such as what children do when they play role-playing games. You can also dream about others, but in sleep one cannot dream together with others as you can work and imagine things together with others. So, all theorizing is like dreaming, he says, in this way, when you actually do it, you're necessarily alone. So, we, how, this is how he, he goes through, um, in the article, different kinds of um, um, realities, and in the um, left column there, he has the categories that he tries to, to use on each um, reality. I won't go into details, I might do it in an article later. That's how he characterizes these reality, different realities. The main object for truth in this analysis is in fact to set the work that takes place in everyday practice life against the theoretical thinking in science, in all kinds of science. Um, saying that all insights, scientific theoretical insights, Going, are going back to the life world in one or another way. So this must be underlined. Everyday life triumphs all the time. It is the world we go in and out of through the diversity of these other realities. He also says that realities may have an, an enclave, enclave in another one. Uh, for instance, when we reflect, that is theoretical, on phenomena in our daily life. The use of the word epoche is used to describe this social phenomena, and not as an entrance to the phenomenological reduction as Husserl did. It just means that to put something out of play for a moment. Okay, when we transfer this um, multiple reality theory to school situations, so we have to, to first ask if we can use the theory as, as a starting point and applying it to understand the present educational situation in the post-truth era. The first obvious application, I think, is that school is one of these multiple realities. The world of school may be further analyzed as such, as um, uh, Schultz did with these other realities, but I will not do it here, take too much time. Rather, I will point to another obvious application, of the theory when it turns towards the realities that students bring with them from home or from their uh, local lives, which is more important. This is not only religious ones, but also today from social, virtual media realities in the classroom. All these realities meet the finite meanings of the classroom. A classroom, ideally, of course, with a clear structure of beliefs, values and practices. Further on transferring this theory to school situation, we might say that teachers today face a new and often challenging multicultural situation to create some common meaning from the different experiences children bring to school. So what kind of challenge does that pose to the teacher? 
So may the students should some theory, that's my question, how may the should some theories come to help to understand the constitution of meaning here, the interest and the motivation at school, and how teachers are to meet them. Um, if we compare these, uh, the history of realities in the Schutzian sense with social subgroups, we might say that Schutz did not describe these subgroups as such, um, although he mentions um, um, religious experience um, or, or even secular worldviews could then be uh, added to this kind of uh, group. Uh, mentality. However, uh, reality should describe, incorporate formal structure that also holds good for, for attitudes within subgroups like the one we are looking at now. What interests me are particularly in group realities such as denominations and religious cults and sect, but also all group realities are relevant in this connection, I think. It's interesting that the uh, multiple reality theory found its way into interpretive sociology with the notion of plausibility structure with Berger and Lukman. Plausibility structures in sociology of religion, for instance, is a social cultural context of system for systems of meaning where these meanings make sense, made plausible, so to say. And beliefs and meanings must be supported. We see that. Um, concerning religions at least, must be supported and further legitimized and strengthened in order to survive. Every institution has to legitimize itself, but, but um, religious um, 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 groups in particular, perhaps. And we see that in Norway and perhaps also in Scandinavia, there's a freedom of religions, of course, but there's not an equality of religions for historical and demographic reasons. There's a Protestant Christianity, it's still dominating, but not highly plausible any longer. And uh, we see that they always have to, to, to legitimize their place in society. Well, a little bit on in-group bias too. Different groups with their particularities, particularities come with different epochés in Schutzian terminology. They're carrying with them what appears to the teacher as in-group bias often. It could be net-based or amplified in social media in different ways. It may lead to knowledge resistance, as resistance of evidence perhaps, and making their own truth claim more probable, probably. Probable. Uh, operating, they are maybe operating in digital information channels where the, their own beliefs and convictions are further confirmed. And this is also called motivated thinking, where core feature, it is a core feature in all knowledge resistance and also behind fact polarizing, as we see it perhaps particularly in the United States of America today. Uh, this leads to this um, fact um, uh, knowledge resistance leads to a dissolution of the connection between facts and understanding. We could say that deep learning is the ability to connect facts, so facts are very important. While to be critical means to give good reasons to believe a claim or a proposition. Knowledge is justified through beliefs. Okay. Um, I could also mention that in connection with in-group bias, there's a mentality that I might call moral short-sightedness. Um, and this is some kind of consequence of the epoche theory for the study of moral judgment. Um, the way we think about others, the theoretical judgment, the way we consider them, uh, valuational judgment and how we are willing to deal with them, practical judgment. We think, value and act differently towards others according to the distance from our body, for instance. Okay. We'll not go further into this. Um, point here. Um, when we transfer it to the didactic discussion in school, we have to, to think to discuss it in relation to what has been called the non-affirmative solution in the building pedagogy. This is a pedagogical discussion that might help us to understand this challenge, I think. 
Uh, I'm referring to the non-affirmative building theory, um, going back to Herbert and explicated perhaps um, uh, most um, um, uh, vividly by Dritich um, Banner. It's a solution to the pedagogical paradox between coercion and freedom. It's art theological with the value hierarchy, saying that we're not to instruct children, not to instruct them to a specific identity, but it's, school is neither to be a value-free or value-judgment-free teaching. There must be operative, operative reality of value hierarchy, for instance, human rights. Um, so how are we to understand and manage this theory in a multicultural classroom today? When children come to school with heavy epochets and an in-group bias of knowledge. A solution perhaps, and this is um, a kind of my uh, solution to the problem, is that we can, as a teacher, we can remove temporarily their epochets. Not to instruct them, but to point as Sprung says at their epochets while presenting knowledge that is justified true beliefs. Point at the reality without their epochets, and this experience they can bring with them back to their everyday life. Not only theoretically, but perhaps also in their valuing or willing judgment and practice. And uh, perhaps this can develop what is often called the double competence in the multicultural society, knowing both the school reality and the, uh, their own in-group bias reality. And hopefully this could pave the path, pave the way to less knowledge resistance generally and we could ask if this is not a micro situation of integration of democracy, since a democracy needs a well-informed citizens, as Schutz called it um, in another article he wrote, and he um, explained the well-informed citizen as a social type between an expert and an ignorant. Uh, there's another possibility too um, that might further enlighten our discussion here. Um, there is an American philosopher, analytical philosopher, nevertheless he, he presented what he called positions of logical, epistemological truth claims. Um, he differed between relativism, but anything may be true, um, absolutism, only one thing is true. Skepticism, nothing is true. And his preferred position than possibilism, something may be true. And this leads to a plural, plural teaching theory, didactical theory, where we accept different truth claims while at the same time accepting there being true knowledge. It's an anti-fact nihilism. So possibilism is um, obviously already part of a non-affirmative building theory, but in relation to the realities of the post-truth era, I think it could be further explicated and strengthened. So I think that we must combine this possibilism that Resser um, points out with this non-affirmative building theory as clearly as we can. Thank you.